Okay, I believe we are ready to go. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am really appreciative of this new technology that enables us to, to gather today. I um, wanna begin by thanking my co-chair, Carl Bond, uh, for participating in this subcommittee. And also let you know, Carl, that we're thinking of you um, with the loss that you've suffered. And uh, welcome. And I want to uh, also begin by thanking Representative Frank Cook and Daryl Parsons, chairs of the Law Enforcement Accountability Task Force. Uh, your leadership enables this subcommittee to function. And I know the, the hard work that it took to get us here for uh, our kickoff meeting. And thank you so much. Want to especially also thank the House staff for their work coordinating this subcommittee as well as all of the subcommittees. And thank uh, DTI. Without DTI, uh, we would be entirely isolated in this new environment in which we find ourselves. So uh, lots of thanks to DTIs. Um, I am uh, being told that I would like, uh, we would like, the subcommittee members to turn on their cameras so that uh, when we are all speaking with each other that we have you on camera if possible. I realize some of you may not be able to do that, so that's fine also. Um, so with that, uh, let, me, let me also thank the members of the public who took time out of their schedules and their lives to uh, join us today. Thank you everyone for participating. George Floyd died begging for his life and calling out for his mother. It was heartbreaking and horrifying at the same time. He is not alone. Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tamir Rice, and so many people have died needlessly. And for millions of people, it was only the latest injustice in a 400 year history of racism that this country has never truly had a reckoning with. Thankfully, the officer in the George Floyd case has been arrested and charged with murder. The officers who stood by and chose to be bystanders have also been arrested and charged with aiding and abetting that murder. It is my fondest hope that justice will ultimately be served, but it did cause an awakening across this country um, among all Americans. We cannot any longer abide by the status quo and Americans, including me, are asking for change. This didn't start with George Floyd and it didn't start in Minneapolis. Racial disparity is rife throughout our society in every state and in every system of justice. And I say that because I have spent my career in the criminal justice system as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney and now as your attorney general. And I know because it was the reason I ran that many changes needed to be made in the system as a whole, each part of it has to come to a recognition that change is necessary before we can cure systemic racism and be fair to everyone. Those changes need to be made in the policing system, no less than they need to be made in the system of prosecution, no less than they need to be made in the justice system itself, in the judicial system that decides the sentences of individuals who have been convicted of crime. And no less than it needs to be made in our correction system. And we cannot achieve true justice until each part of our system looks inside ourselves and says, not you're the one to blame, you need to change, but how do we all come together and change? And I think that change begins by having an honest look inside ourselves and saying, we need to do different. We need to do the things that aren't easy. We need to do the tough stuff. I have so much appreciation, respect, and I so much honor 
the good work that police officers do in our society. So many police officers are our everyday heroes. Sometimes we read about great good works and heroic works that the police do. But what I've seen on a daily basis working with police are the quiet things they do. Coaching a basketball team in the communities that they serve, donating books, indeed teaching children how to read and giving of their time selflessly, their own time selflessly for the good of others. I also believe that police enter that profession, that noble profession, because they care about the rest of us and they wanna serve the public. And so it's incumbent upon us to help unite, not divide, to help unite communities that have distrust of the police because they have been victimized by so many aspects of the criminal justice system for so many years that they have become estranged from it. We serve those communities, we serve those people. And we need to make sure that their voices are heard, recognized, and that we have the courage to take the hard decisions that we have to make and to make those for the good of everyone. I really am delighted and honored to be working with all of you and most particularly with Carl Bond, whom I've known for many years as one of those great law enforcement officers. Carl, I don't know if you would like to make a few remarks before we, we um, go to the next phase. Uh, the only thing I like to say is like, <clears throat> You know, being a police officer, especially nowadays, is, is very challenging. Um, I served for 31 years and never did I expect or want people to praise me because I was a police officer. I did it because I cared about the people that I served. And I always treated the people that I served with dignity until they gave me a reason to treat them without dignity. And I think uh, we as police officers, sometimes we're, we're afraid or we don't want to admit when we're wrong. And I think that's, that's the biggest challenge that we have right now is when we do something wrong, we have to be willing and able to admit that we've done something wrong. And, 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 and you know, take the repercussions that we're gonna get when we do something wrong and then take the praise when we do something the right way. So, and for the most part, 99% of the officers out there do the things the right way. It's just that 1%. And if we can get that 1% to change their, their, their mindset, we'll be fine. Thank you, Carl. True words were never said <laughs> more eloquently. Thank you so much for your remarks. And um, I wanna make sure that all of the subcommittee members introduce themselves. Um, so let's start uh, in order with Larry Johnson and please uh, let us know, you know briefly why you have chosen to join this subcommittee as well. Larry. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Larry Johnson. Um, my background as both uh, a community activist, a mediator, and as a former police officer informs me about a lot of the things that I have seen in the media and seen uh, in our communities uh, regarding uh, effective and fair policing. This has, uh, and to be quite frank, there are some instances and some activities that have caused me some consternation and some concern um, as a member of the public and as, as an informed member of the public. Um, I've been on the street as a police officer. I've been on the, on the street as a police supervisor. I've been in the classroom as a police trainer. I've been in the fleet in the United States Navy as a counterterrorism and uh, crowd control expert. I have had years to be able to go ahead and look at my experiences and compare them to the experiences today that I see amongst law enforcement, prosecutors, the public. And I see a vast disconnect in how people regard all of those particular segments of the society. And I think that this is an effective opportunity for us to be able to to review, consider, discuss, and come to accommodation on what we think is a fair 
and equitable process in policing, particularly with regards to the use of excessive force. Um, I personally have taught excessive uh, uh, use of force uh, in the classroom to over 300 police officers. And I am disturbed by some of the things that I have seen and I do have questions. Um, I'm also concerned by some of the rhetoric that I've heard from some in the law enforcement community. They say that they are under attack. This could not be farther from the truth. What is happening is that they are under scrutiny because there is not simply just the 1% or the one bad apple. There needs to be a reckoning for those who tolerate the 1% as well. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Larry. And we look forward to your continuing comments and input to the subcommittee. Thank you for joining us. Marianne Kemble Moore. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you all and to be working on this matter. I am with the Coalition Against Domestic Violence. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Policy there. And I am here because of 30 plus years of being a social worker in the state and my deep passion and belief in our justice system as well. Over those 30 plus years, I've worked with victims of crime in the justice system and have had the privilege of working with extraordinary members of our police departments across the state and with our prosecutor's office and am familiar with the law around these issues and felt that it was very important to make sure that victims' voices are heard in this process because there are oftentimes situations where uh, police respond and matters, particularly with domestic violence, may escalate uh, to a more lethal uh, situation. In fact, in our academies, police officers learn very early on that domestic violence situations, although common and frequent in terms of the response, can become very lethal and dangerous, particularly to the police officer. And so these difficult situations require real consideration. And as the Attorney General indicated, requires us to look at, it, at our policies and our procedures and not to assume that the status quo is acceptable. We know in the state that domestic violence victims and other victims find themselves being arrested and becoming uh, charged with crimes during incidents where police respond. And we know that there are, again, great risks that police officers deal with in these situations. And so we hope to be able to contribute not only uh, the victim's perspective, uh, but also an opportunity to, to consider how we can improve training and other issues related to the use of force. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marianne. It's good to see you. And next we have uh, Chief Robert Kraisela. Chief? Proclamation. Chief, are you on? I think you may be muted. There we go. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Rob Grisola, um, Chief of Police here in Middletown. Uh, I've been in law enforcement for now 38 years. Um, I had a very diverse career. I started out in a municipal department with Dover City Police. I spent 27 years with State Police, from which I retired and had a very uh, kind of diverse experience there, working um, from SWAT teams to working on a SISM team, which is a critical incident stress management team or, or peer, uh, peer counseling. Um, and, and then going to alcohol, tobacco enforcement, doing some regulatory work, and then chief of Seaford, and then ultimately now um, the chief of Middletown. And so when throughout that 38 um, years of policing, I've seen a lot of changes. Um, I've seen a lot of changes, um, both good and bad. Like the uh, And use of force has changed dramatically. And the acceptable use of force has changed dramatically over the years. Um, it was way, way different back in the 80s when I started. Um, and, and what's even acceptable now, not that it was right back then, but I'm just saying what was accepted back then, or maybe it was just uh, never brought to light. 
So of course, transparency and education is, is critically important uh, whenever you're dealing with the use of force issue. Um, and use of force is you know, very, very complex. Um, you know, the, the one thing that we have going for us is Graham Connor, and that, that kind of describes the, um, the complexity of use of force and why it's, um, there is no this equals that ever when it comes to use of force and uh, everyone has to realize that. So educating the public is I think critically important, um, not only just ed educating the officers and, um, but educating the public and transparency, which in my 37 years prior to coming here, never had body worn cameras and in the first three months that i was here i loved it um you know why because it worked very very well for me um you know because i can go ahead and i can see exactly make determinations back on that but i always gotta always remember that there's a human factor when you're using uh, when in a use of force incident so never want to forget those kind of things but um so i'm honored to be here uh, i hope i can be a valuable addition to to this group here and i'm honored to be a part of um, the group thank you Thank you, Chief. Next, AJ Roop. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, AJ Roop, I am the state prosecutor at the Delaware Department of Justice. I am uh, lucky enough to work for Kathy in that. <laughs> you didn't have to say division. that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I oversee our entire criminal division statewide, so we have uh, about 116 prosecutors and 250 employees total. Uh, and the reason I got involved in this subcommittee is because it's a pretty important topic. Um, Kathy's heard me say this internally, and anyone who works for me at the DOJ right now has heard me say it. Um, Delaware, at least from a law enforcement standpoint, and I like to think from the AG's office, is number one in a lot of ways compared to other states. When you compare um, the way we do things and the way we train, we do a lot of really good things. Um, and, but the only way to stay number one and to be out ahead uh, is to constantly look at things and discuss uh, internally and externally, not only with experts and, and people in the law enforcement field, but also the community um, to make sure that we are doing things the right way. And if we're not, to make that adjustment so that we can continue to be number one in a lot of those ways. Uh, or as Chief Crisala said, um, work on publishing, publishing or talking about we're better educating people about the good things that we are doing. One thing I see, um, at, in, at least in this context and in a lot of other ways, is there is a, a real disconnect in communication. And sometimes it has to be that way. But in terms of talking with the public, the times I've had interactions with the public, uh, when you go th through and actually explain things, it opens people's eyes a lot. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there for that. I think there's a lot of opportunities to make some changes that can make us better and get us out ahead or keep us out ahead of a lot of other states. And to piggyback off of what Marianne said earlier, I think any opportunity we have to, to look internally and talk about different trainings we can do that are not only good for the public, but also keep police officers safe and going home and helping people is something we should always be willing to look at, discuss and take advantage of. Thanks, AJ. Next, we have James Turner, James. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Turner, and I'm an attorney in the Office of Defense Services. I work in the felony unit, and I'm really honored, and I look forward to being a part of this subcommittee. Um, one of the reasons why I really wanted to be a part of this subcommittee is because I think this is really important work, and it's, a, it's an issue that's gripping the nation as well as the state of Delaware. And I'm, I'm glad that our state is one of the leaders um, in getting ahead of this issue. And, I think good reform has an opportunity to be a win-win uh, for everyone. It has an opportunity to enhance public trust, enhance trust in the community. And in my conversations with my clients, I think trust is an issue that needs to be improved. And so I think it can enhance trust, but also I think it can enhance public safety. So I think good reform is a win-win and I'm really honored to be a part of this subcommittee. Thank you, James. Lieutenant Thomas Bracken. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the reason I, I was uh, interested in this subcommittee is will become pretty apparent. I'm a 33 year uh, member of the Delaware State Police. And for the past 20, I've been uh, either the vice president or as currently I am, I sit as the president of the Delaware State Troopers Association. So clearly, uh, if you're gonna be a law enforcement labor leader uh, today, you need to be involved uh, on the front lines 
looking at ways to make our profession better, to make people believe uh, in us and to grow the confidence uh, of the members of the public and the people we serve, and also to be, be there to help work with legislators as we have with the Troopers Association on meaningful and reasonable um, criminal justice reform wherever possible. And I've worked with uh, AG Jennings and a lot of members on both sides of the aisle over the years on many of those uh, issues uh, of concern. I also provide a unique perspective to this committee as for the past 20 years in my role with the DSTA, I have been out on just about every uh, state police use of deadly force. I've been involved in those cases um, and can provide some level of uh, expertise through additional trainings that I've gone to uh, over the years when it, in use of force and in the laws that guide use of force. Um, but I think most people would, would, would believe that um, most law enforcement labor unions and their leaders are in the business of simply uh, trying to get police officers off when they do wrong. And I can assure you that that's not the way the Delaware State Troopers Association operates currently, nor in the past. Um, we recognize that uh, law enforcement officers and troopers make mistakes. And when they do make a mistake, um, they're held accountable and they need to be held accountable, as do any law enforcement officers across this country. I do believe that there is room to uh, look at some of our policies and training and procedures and maybe some of the laws that govern use of force. I just think that uh, it's important that we take a, a holistic view and that one of the bigger reasons also that I'm interested is we need to make sure then any changes that we make uh, don't have the unintended consequences of making a very difficult and dangerous job uh, of being a law enforcement officer today even more dangerous. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll, I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, Lieutenant Bracken. State Representative Sean Lynn. Hi everyone, this is Sean. Um, I am the chair of the House Judiciary Committee and serve as the representative for the 31st District, which is located in the city of Dover. I am also a private attorney uh, doing litigation in Delaware's courts. Um, as such, just very interested in and more and mostly listening to the various viewpoints uh, that everyone will present during these hearings. And I look forward to working with all of you uh, to find some equitable and just solutions to the issues that are facing Delawareans. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lynn. Dubar McGriff could not be with us this afternoon. I'll turn to Chief Defender Brendan O'Neill. Brendan. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kathy and Mr. Bond for agreeing to chair this uh, committee, uh, the focus, the subcommittee, the focus of which is law enforcement's use of force. And that's gonna obviously involve circumstances in which the use of force was appropriate. And also uh, look at circumstances in which the use of force may be deemed inappropriate. And my interest is both on a professional and a personal level. Professionally, I, uh, uh, you know, I'm part of a law firm that defends about 85% of the people charged with crimes in Delaware the Office of Defense Services. And so our clients often have interaction with the police. Some of those are very uh, um, uh, very good interactions. Others, uh, it's not so, not so good. Uh, and in some cases, um, there are allegations that the police officer acted uh, with excessive force. So in, in, in my role, I, I wanna be sure that um, the police are treating our clients appropriately. And if they're not, that they're held accountable if they're using uh, excessive force. In addition, I, I'm a city uh, of Wilmington resident. I'm part of a community in which I am a consumer of police services. So I really look forward to, uh, you know, having a, a, a police force that is uh, uh, in partnership with its community members to create a safe environment and a better living situation for all the residents of our city. So my interests really stem from um, two, uh, two places, one, my job, and two, where I live and uh, how I choose to live. So um, I'm looking forward to working with everyone and um, thank you for your leadership, Kathy and, um, uh, and Mr. Bond. Thank you, Brendan. 
I'll next turn to William Resto. Is William with us? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I look forward to, um, well, I'm here on behalf of Nuestra Raices of Delaware. Um, I'm really looking forward to being on this, this subcommittee. Uh, I think it's needed. Um, I think this is going to be laying a foundation uh, moving forward to the community. Uh, I'm also a bail bondsman and a fugitive recovery agent. So I'm always in the community. I still have contacts with the community and community leaders where I can go back and discuss some things with them as well. And again, I look forward to being on this subcommittee and I wanna thank Mr. Cook for inviting me. Thank you, Mr. Resto. I believe that Iman Umar Khalif Hassan El was unable to join us this afternoon as well. So we will turn to Yasinia Tavares. Is Yasinia with us or muted? Okay, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to join everyone this afternoon and be a part of this subcommittee. I am Yasinia Tavares. And uh, for those who don't know, I am a local reporter with the City of Wilmington's government TV station. I have an award-winning television talk show. I'm a talk show host Ooh. where I educate the uh, community through visual storytelling. So that's where I would come in uh, to do interviews and things of that nature and tell the story to our viewers uh, so they can get in more in depth uh, into what we're doing. I also, outside of uh, being a reporter, talk show host, uh, I serve on the board of directors for communities and schools. And um, outside of that, what I do personally that I really love is uh, try to educate and uh, be there for victims who have been sexually assaulted or have experienced uh, domestic violence or intimate partner violence, especially during this pandemic. Uh, I've done a lot of videos in regards to that. I've been working with the, the judicial process, um, the district attorney's office, trying to see more of uh, what I can do to help educate victims during this time, during this pandemic. And so uh, that's where my personal interest is, is really bridging that gap between the victims, um, how the process works with the offenders and also with our court system here. Uh, so wherever I can fit in, that's where I'm here to do, but I'm very excited to uh, learn as much as I can and um, also educate our constituents so that way they're also informed. Thank you, Yusinia, and welcome. We have Delisi Washington next. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Delisi Washington, and I'm a licensed clinical worker. I specialize in psycholegal immigration evals. I'm an adjunct social work instructor at Eastern University's Esperanza College. And for the last two years, I've served as co-coordinator for a network Delaware Safe Communities Coalition. That's a group that works to promote policies and protect immigrant communities and address inequities within health, education, and the criminal justice system. So I personally strive to promote cultural humility, compassion, and social justice amongst individuals, communities, and larger systems. So I consider it a duty and felt the need to be a part of this. I am I feel fortunate. I'm looking to learn and also participate and contribute however I can with my expertise. So I thank you all. Thank you. James Wright. Attorney General Kathy Jennings and Vice Chair Vine, along with other subcommittee members, good afternoon. Uh, I have 25 years of service in law enforcement. I served as the uh, inspector of police in charge of uniform operations while serving the Wilmington Police Department. When I retired from there, I worked for the um, courts where I served as a deputy state court administrator for approximately 11 and a half years. Uh, I also have a military background, um, served um, in leadership in that capacity I did for about 30 years. Um, there's a couple of things that I think that I can assist with, and I certainly um, would like to see an opportunity to, opportunity to uh, affect change, certainly within police departments. But I, I believe that it's very, very important for us to look at the leadership across the board of all of our law enforcement agencies, 
to make sure that they are in support of chains that we recommend. And um, the second thing that I'm interested in is making sure that uh, we see a cultural change in, in some of our police departments. I think that's also important. Um, that's what I would like to see moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Steve Villanueva. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve Villanueva. I'm here representing the Latin American Community Center. As you may all know, um, Latin American Community Center's been providing services to the media community for 51, 52 years. Uh, my father, I don't know if this qualifies me for anything, but my father was a former police officer uh, in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Uh, my job here at the Latin American Community Center is uh, information technology. I'm the VP of technology here. Been here about 21 years. Met many police officers here in Wilmington. All good guys. Um, I'm hoping that by being part of this, I can help this issue of excessive use of force. Um, I myself have experienced it. Um, but then again, you know, it's, it's up to the person, it's up to who's applying that use of force. I mean, you know, we all make mistakes. Hopefully um, we can guide uh, officers to, you know, to take a different approach. Um, that's all I have. Thank you for uh, having me. No. Thank you, Steve, for joining us. And, and thank you everyone for being willing to serve on this really important uh, subcommittee and for everyone who has, uh, everyone who's spoken today is committed to keeping an open mind and to having a, a respectful and, and robust dialogue on the changes that we believe need to be made and the recommendations that the subcommittee will make ultimately. And so I encourage people to participate in all of the meetings and to help us uh, with additional suggestions about materials that should be provided, experts we should talk with, and uh, how we should go forward. Uh, because collaboratively with the talent in this subcommittee, I am convinced that, that we can make the necessary changes and do it in a respectful and inclusive manner. Um, so having said that, let's turn to the mission and objectives of this subcommittee. Uh, it is uh, all established through Senate Bill 260 and the use of force and imminent danger subcommittee was formed for the purpose of assessing the feasibility for and viability of a statutorily created use of force standard and implementation of an imminent danger policy to encourage officers to employ all tactics necessary to avoid using deadly force. The objectives of this committee have also been spelled out, and that is to review the use of force statute, to um, review use of force standard policy across law enforcement offices in this state, to examine de-escalation expectations of law enforcement agencies, to determine the use of force expectations by means other than deadly force, to determine intervention and reporting requirements of officers who misuse force, to examine body-worn camera policy and the use of force incidents, and to consider expanding the Department of Justice's role in the use of force case reviews that we have currently and traditionally handled. Finally, to explore, finally, but frankly, very importantly, to explore standardizing the data that is reported in this state on use of force cases so that we have the necessary information going forward that will enable us to keep making better and better decisions collectively. 
There are a number of those objectives that we have to cover um, in this subcommittee. And so we're gonna be working on all of them. Many of them, most of them actually are related and each one of them is important in its own way. We have provided materials uh, to start us off. And those materials uh, have come from various sources. Uh, one is a, a use of force information recap uh, that was largely derived from an article done by Chris Barish in June of this year. Another is a use of force statute that uh, we, we, when I say we, inside the Attorney General's office, over the course of the summer, uh, we asked two of our law clerks to do a 50 state review on use of force statutes so that we would have an idea of what other states have done, what standards they are using when they define uh, what is reasonable and what is not reasonable, whether there are subjective standards or objective standards. And so, I really encourage you to at least on the wave top sort of look at that. I, the findings that I took from that is that Delaware is a small minority of uh, states. I think there are only three that have an almost entirely subjective standard on their justification statute. That is not so on police policy, which we'll talk about separately. We, uh, we also have included in the review um, the recently enacted state use of force policies. And I really want to um, credit and, and give great thanks to the police chief's council. They have been working long and hard on a model use of force policy for this state. I know various departments in the state, the Delaware State Police, the city of Wilmington and others have been working and reworking their use of force policies. The goal here is to enact a statewide policy that would cover all 48 police departments in this small state of Delaware. And that uh, would encompass within it issues that we're talking about in the subcommittee, such as de-escalation, de the duty to intervene, and the duty to report among others. And so, um, we, we will be taking a deep dive into those use of force policies, including Chief Ogden's um, work and the work of the Delaware State Police, uh, as well as the Police Chiefs Council as a whole. They've been hard hardworking <laughs> chiefs for the, for the entire summer. And I think they've, they've got some great ideas and have tried to put together the best of the best and often have drawn upon the CALEA standards that police uh, follow for um, certification. I uh, also included, because I, I think it is the sort of seminal uh, investigation and report on uh, police shootings, I have included the use of force report in the Jeremy McDowell case. I think someone said uh, when they were introducing themselves that this is complex. And it is very complex when we look at one incident of use of force. And I know that former Attorney General Matt Den spent a great deal of time examining that killing as well as looking at the law very carefully and determining whether he had the legal authority to bring a charge. As you will see in the use of force report, he determined there was probable cause to arrest one officer and it was the officer who fire, fired first. But he also determined that outside experts who had frankly been on the side of prosecution in the Tamir Rice case had concluded that our statute would not allow the, the bringing the successful prosecution of that case under the current standard in our statute. So I think the Jeremy McDowell situation is in large measure um, an analysis of what are the outer edges of when a case gets prosecuted and when it doesn't, and whether this subcommittee believes that there should be changes to the use of force statute in our state. 
The uh, materials also include uh, use of force data from the Division of Civil Rights and Public Trust, which is a division inside the Attorney General's Office. For decades and decades, the Attorney General's Office has been charged, as most of you know, with investigating and reporting on and determining whether prosecution go, should go forward against an officer for the use of deadly force. So uh, most of those have been shooting cases. Over the last 15 years in, in Delaware, there have been 56 people who have been shot. 30 of them have been killed. Nearly half of those who were shot are black um, in a state where black people make up just 22% of the population. So it's important for us to look at what, what does that tell us? You know, what does that tell us and what does that mean we ought to be thinking of? There are many other aspects of the use of force reports that are on the website that everyone can read that are, I think they're studied by the subcommittee. One of them is mental health. And we really ought to be having some further elucidation, further education on mental health because what I have seen most recently in many of the uh, shootings that we have looked at as an office is that there's a serious mental illness or a mental health crisis at play uh, at the time that the police used force. 11 of the last 35 officer involved shootings reviewed by the Department of Justice involve mental health issues. So I think it's incumbent upon us to look at that. We ask the police to do so much uh, including uh, at times to be a mental health expert. And is there an alternative to this that may make us all safer and at the same time relieve the police of that really difficult, almost impossible responsibility? Uh, and we ought to take, uh, in my view, a further and deeper dive in use of force policies um, we will circulate the model policy that Chief Ogden and the Delaware Police Chiefs Council have been working on. And as I say, I really wanna thank them. They have put together a comprehensive policy. So uh, we have a lot of work to do in short. <laughs> and there's a lot uh, of information for us to discuss already. So I would uh, encourage people who would like to comment on what material, you know, the materials that have been handed out to date. They also include, I believe, uh, a draft of a bill that the D Department of Justice, our office has written that would change the use of force statute in our state to make it an objectively reasonable test as opposed to a subjective test. All of this, including your own um, thoughts about what this subcommittee should be doing are open to discussion. And I'd be very grateful if anyone would like to uh, volunteer ideas and thoughts about what I've just discussed. Kathy, uh, thank you very much for sharing. This is Mary Ann Kenville Moore. I just wanted to share how helpful these documents were and reviewing them in advance of the meeting. It really helped me understand a number of issues uh, that we need to address. And I feel like the objectives that were laid out are, are good. Um, but I also think that uh, looking at those public policies um, is something that we need to examine um, closely. And so I look forward to getting the model uh, policy. I wonder, are all of these documents going to be made available to the public so that they can have access to these as well? Yes. Yes. And thank you, Marianne. We will get that model policy to everyone as well as the public. I want to respect Chief Ogden's <laughs> wishes, but I believe it's, a, it's at a point when it can be shared. Um, and so, you know, there very well may be changes that get made within this subcommittee or by the police chief's council along the way. The goal ultimately is to have that be a statewide standard and that it be uh, enacted in some form into law, not just be a policy because 
We have model policies that the Police Chiefs Council um, has worked on over the years. For example, we have a body, model body-worn camera policy, uh, but it is not required that every police department adopt that. And so, you know, with body-worn cameras, some of the changes in policy among the departments have to do with their size, resources, et cetera. Um, but I wanna make sure that you have all the materials. So we'll make sure you get that policy. Does anybody have thoughts on the mental health component? I was frankly not surprised that so many of the shootings, uh, in so many of the shootings, there is a mental health crisis going on uh, and a component that is either preexisted because of mental illness or because um, of a particular traumatic circumstance. Attorney General Jennings, if I could address some of the uh, shootings that we've been on uh, that involve mentally disturbed individuals. I think there has to be a differentiation, though. I, I understand um, the national view of trying to put um, mental health workers on the front lines along with law enforcement officers. But I think it's important to note that um, once one of these individuals um, is in possession of a firearm, and is, has already gone probably farther than where a mental health professional would be able to be interjected into that situation. So from a law enforcement perspective, I can assure you that we would be happily seed our initial response to many complaints that clearly involve someone who is in some type of mental distress where maybe we don't need to be the initial um, people that deal with them. But I think it's important that when you're starting to talk about those cases where mentally uh, disturbed people have had, uh, have resulted in deadly force encounters with law enforcement, those have gone beyond where uh, already, uh, where a mental health professional would be able to help, unfortunately. But I can assure you that in talking to the folks that I represent, we know that we um, are woefully, uh, underprepared to handle some of the folks that we get called on a daily basis to encounter. And that um, as a state and as a country, we do need to get better at getting these people help earlier and better intervention strategies prior to ever having to have um, an armed police officer be the person who has to deal with those people when they're in crisis. Well said, Lieutenant Bracken, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think that, you know, in the more recent shootings for which we have issued reports, um, I would say three of the last four that I can recall um, had a mental health component to them. And we ruled that all of them were justified under the law. Um, so the question is, could there have been an earlier point in time, as you say, when um, someone is destabilizing and could have been helped in another way. And, uh, and not in any of the ones I looked at recently, but I think in some, there is a legitimate question of, of trying to, to make sure that de-escalation tactics are employed and that police departments have the resources to have you know, the, the right people there at the scene for de-escalation. And so I'm not commenting on any one case when I say that. I just think these are sort of the deep dives we need to do um, to make sure that we're both educating the public, as you say, Lieutenant Brecken, and resourcing uh, police departments and other agencies, mental health agencies, uh, with the, the tools they need to avoid that final call being made. Um, and I know that police agencies throughout our state are, are working on this. The Newcastle County Police got a grant to have a mental health expert ride in a police car um, and, you know, to be there during a mental health crisis. I know the state police uh, have been working because we're part of that work, AJ Roop in particular, with uh, DSAM in Delaware to, to work on uh, intervention as well. 
So those steps are beginning. They're very, very important and good steps. Um, but you're right. At the point in time when someone has a gun in their hand or charges at an officer with a knife, then that's not the point in time when a mental health expert necessarily can intervene. It's, it's before then. I do think that there's an opportunity for added training and what it looks like to de-escalate when someone is already in a heightened or overwhelming state and exhibiting aggression. Um, so I don't want to negate that either. I agree with what everyone has said, but I, I do think that there is an increased opportunity mm -hmm. to try and do better and understand what it would mean when someone's in that heightened state from a mental health perspective to either get them to react, right? So that they can actually um, follow an instruction that doesn't lead to, to lethal consequences. Um, but I agree with everyone. And I, I think there's I more conversations to be had trust. so that we can I look into the intricacies trust. Kathy, I'd be interested in the ways that we could potentially identify those situations earlier on and expand on um, what Tom talked about a little bit and what you mentioned, which is, you know, basically having these mental health um, experts available is almost like a multidisciplinary approach to this. So I think that starts earlier in the process before a police or a mental health professional even arrives on scene. So I think part of this group really needs to dig into how we can make law enforcement and anyone who's going to be involved in these situations aware of that uh, before anyone even over arrives on scene. So there's a plan in place. Um, you know, all, police officers end up having to wear a lot of hats in these situations. And when you've, you know, you've got somebody who is uh, destabilized and you're trying to keep everybody safe who's around uh, and also work on de-escalating that situation, having, um, having a plan in place if you identify it early uh, and I think that starts back at dispatch and, and, and some other, maybe even further back than that, if we know that someone has struggled uh, recently, uh, there can be a plan in place that prevents it from ever getting to that situation that Tom talked about, where someone's got a weapon and now they're, they're presenting a danger to police officers and the public and themselves. So I think that's something we should look at uh, and something we can probably expand upon in the state and in terms of keeping everybody safe. Um, so, you know, this, this sort of gets into not just the research that needs to be done, but are there police agencies in the country um, that do have that ongoing? And, you know, I know Delaware State Police has been working on this for months and months with our office and others with DSAM and the Newcastle County Police has it uh, as well. I think it might be helpful to hear uh, from an agency that has incorporated the mental health component, not only into on the scene, but as you said, Delicia, in training and what comes before. Um, that's, that's critically important. And I have to give a caveat here. I was, I was on the board of NAMI and I know that people who suffer from mental illness are overwhelmingly nonviolent. This is not uh, about that. This is about the very few people who have a form of mental illness or crisis that trips over into violence. Um, so, and dangerousness to themselves, their family members, children, and, and the public. And so uh, I just wanna make sure that we say that and we say it often and loudly. Um, but I think, I, you know, so the mental illness piece bleeds over into a lot of things. One is education, another is training. Um, and the de-escalation piece comes into play there. And the other is what Lieutenant Bracken said, which is let's try to get the right tools, let's try to get the right resources for mental health to people earlier so that that call to the police at the end is never made. Um, the thing I want to add, though, is you can have all the training and all the plans you want, but when a person turns violent, you have to make a split second decision. That's tough. And, and, and the way you the way you perceive that is, is, is basically the way you were raised your culture. So your culture is going to determine 
how you perceive a threat. So that, that mental health component, you can have all, you can have a mental health expert on the scene with you, but as soon as that turns violent, you're talking a whole new ball game. No, it's true. And I just want to go ahead and, and piggyback off what um, Senator Brackett had mentioned about the resources and kind of what Carl was saying, um, because from a smaller agency kind of perspective, it's, it's different because it's, it's very difficult manpower wise um, and resources wise to go ahead and provide a mental health expert that's going to be out there on the street and be available. Um, so what, what's got to be available are options, options for that officer to go ahead and uh, kind of negotiate with that um, place as part of de-escalation. Uh, look, we can go ahead and get you to this place or we can go ahead and provide this service to you. Um, there is a, uh, there, there's, a, there's a church here that we can take you to, but there's no coordination of those services right now, um, at least in, in, in my experience. So, you know, a lot of the churches, they're all, they act independently or, or the, a lot of pastoral care that's out there or a lot of the resources are out there. And, and that group, I think, needs to be brought into it as well, because when you run out of options, ultimately, it, 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 the, the probability of force increases. Um, so you try and go down that option route, which is part of that de-escalation. Um, and so I, I think we, we'd be uh, doing a disservice there if we don't start thinking about providing the um, a whole network of options and so and make it totally inclusive and not just it's not just a police problem um it's it's a it's a synergistic societal pile problem that i think that we have to approach it that way yeah i agree yeah to piggyback what rob is saying i mean i, I work in the schools and i see it in schools with some of our mentally disabled students that you know they have counselors on site that as a constable i'm never even called because they've already de-escalated the situation and that's something, you know, it just, it's not in just law enforcement, that's in, it's all thought that fastest of society where you have that mental health component there. So true. All right, so um, do people have other thoughts about what we should be looking into and whether uh, additional research or your thoughts on bringing experts into our meetings could help us in making decisions? Kathy, this is Mary Ann Penville again. Um, I really support the idea of um, hearing more from other jurisdictions who have done this work well. Uh, but I also know that um, Josh Thomas at NAMI uh, is a really good local mm -hmm. resource for this. We've uh, been partnering with NAMI and DSAM and uh, the Delaware State Police and, and Wilmington Police on the crisis intervention team training over the last five years. And so I, I think part of uh, the, this issue um, is that we've had a lot of informal approaches to how we address mental health with law enforcement. I think we, we need to, as a community, acknowledge that we have been putting law enforcement as the response to these issues and not having it be a mental health response. And so we really do need to bring in that mental health piece. Um, and so I would encourage us to make sure that we're coordinating with NAMI on that, given uh, the, the role that they've played here locally and also their connection to other resources nationally. Marianne, thank you. And I'm happy to ask Josh Thomas to come speak with us and let him know that, you know, the breadth of the topic that we'd like him to cover. Josh was also a police officer in Florida, I believe. And, you know, I undoubtedly would have valuable insight. Um, so I'll, I'll make that ask. I think it's a really good suggestion. Thank you. Kathy, I, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, are, are we going to look at the sort of relationship between 11 Delaware Code sections 464, 465, 466, and Delaware Code section, Title 11, 467, which applies specifically to law enforcement. Um, it seems to me you know, the, proposed, um, the draft bill that the DOJ has prepared, your office has prepared, um, it, it imposes a reasonableness standard on all of those sections and um, 
there's some of us who have a view that that may be too much that we really need it only for 467, which applies to law enforcement officers. So I, I think we ought to have a discussion about that. And um, I don't know if this is the appropriate time or this is something we set on, a, on an agenda for a future, a future meeting. And then to address the concerns that have been expressed here about the, the uh, you know, the difficulties that police officers face in these very stressful uh, circumstances, you know, I, I, and I think if you apply a reasonableness standard to this uh, situation, that in determining whether the officer was reasonable, the determiner will take into account the officer's training the behavior of the defendant, the defendant's mental health condition, whether, you know, uh, what was causing his distress. Consider the officer's available options and what he chose to do. And, and all the activities that were taking place or that the defendant was allegedly doing and what the police officer was doing. It seems to me that, that that's how you get to a determination of whether or not that particular officer was reasonable under the circumstance in those circumstances. And you take into account all of the things that these various law enforcement officers have mentioned today, which are completely legitimate and have to be taken into account. So uh, I, I'm lobbying for a, a reasonableness standard for the uh, uh, judgment of a police officer's actions when there's an allegation of uh, use of force or excessive use of force. Brendan, thank you. And I, I think it's, really a key aspect of whether we make statutory changes, the issues that you brought up, because in when we say reasonableness, you know, in looking at all of these other laws in the various states, many of those laws say under all of the facts and circumstances of the officer as she or he understood them at the time. So it's a reasonableness, but it's an overlay of, you have to look at all the facts and you have to look right. at what that person knew, what that officer knew. And did, what was on that 911 call? Did, was the officer told that this person had a gun and had fired that gun prior to arriving? And that changes the dynamic of what the officer expects when they get there and, and what they anticipate. So I, I agree with you that it is a discussion that we really ought to have. I guess my question for you, Brendan, is what other sort of per person coming to speak to us or other research do you think we need to have done to flesh out that issue? Well, um, I suppose uh, I, I don't have a person in mind. Um, you know, uh, part of it will be the discussion that we have with you know the, the members of this committee. They're experts: Tom Bracken, Mr. Bond. You know, uh, the Chief Crest Casilla, you know, they're they're going to have a lot of input, and that's going to be based on their experience and their expertise. But then there are also people in the industry who uh, uh, can also weigh in, and you know, I'll uh, I can uh, find out someone who might be helpful and suggest that that person come and speak with us. But um, you know, obviously, the expertise of the people we have on this uh, subcommittee that's going to be considered by all of us because it carries great weight. Yeah, undoubtedly. So what we ought to do is put this on a future agenda specifically uh, to address if everyone is in agreement with that. One more thing I'm uh, thinking about before we uh, go beyond that of mental health um, and training is that I believe we need to remember everyone's human, right? And so for our officers who are placed in these difficult situations, I think training also has to really involve what is their own um, emotional regulation. And in those moments, like what options are available to them that will help them in those split second mm -hmm. decision-making and, and what are some, even just practices of like disrupting and making sure that, um, you know, it, we're human, right? Like that there isn't this like excessive force, for example, um, because it's coming from a, an emotional state. Um, so I think there's opportunities for that. And I think we often forget that. And so I want to make sure that they are also supported through that. So when we're speaking or looking into these um, mental health aspects that it also has to do with their own um, 
ability to take care of themselves and, and serve and protect the public. Yeah. I can just add one more thing, and, and probably it's it's an addition to what Ms. Washington was just talking about. Um, yes, in that split seconds of um, decision to make use of force, a lot of things happen. Um, and in fact, there's you know, there's so many physiological effects that occur on the body that I think we need we need to understand like what's going on inside of the body. You know, we have to we have to talk about um, tunnel vision. We have to talk about um, you know loss of dexterity, and we have to talk about all those things. And why do they happen? And so does that factor into your decision making as well? Because with, with training, you have to understand those things because, um, and one of the fundamental things that Dr. Bill Lewinsky talks about, um, which is an analysis of the use of force, uh, and he is a, one of the nationwide experts out there, um, you know, he says, you see, not with your eyes, you see with your brain. So just think about that for a second. Um, when something happens, you know, you have to analyze, it's, it's your proverbial oodle loop. Um, and so you have to analyze what's going on. Um, that gets transferred to your optic nerve, to your brain, uh, goes to your cognitive brain to make a decision, it takes time. And in that time, a lot of things may have occurred. Um, and so what you see on a video camera or, um, or something else may not be what the officer said, and he's not lying. He's telling you what he saw at the time uh, the incident occurred. Um, but because of that 0.35 second delay, a lot of things can happen in 0.35 seconds. So. I think that's important to understand the physiological component of the body and how it works under extreme stress. Um, and I think that's important anytime you're analyzing any use of force. But the, the other part of that chief is, I think for me hearing what everyone just said on here is making sure that we have that, that sort of training regularly statewide for officers, right? So that every, every police officer in Delaware you know, not only gets that sort of training in the academy as they come through, but we're also keeping up with that and constantly updating officers so that they're aware of those things. Because I think that helps in that analysis when you're when you're processing that information, knowing how your body physio physiologically reacts in those situations and, and knowing what the response is going to be like. And then obviously, from an agency standpoint, training and putting yourself in those situations so that you're ready for it when it happens. But from a uniform standpoint, I think that's got to be consistent for every agency. Uh, and there may be some differences here and there, and that's probably something we should look at to make sure everyone's getting, you just, you just put out a lot of information. Um, and, and obviously you, you know a lot about that particular topic, but I don't think that's true for everybody. So I think we want to make sure everybody has that so that it's applied equally across the spectrum. And we make sure we, we have those situations covered. A A.G. Jennings, if I could make two points first, and a, and a shocker for many on this committee, I agree 100% with Brendan O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> in his the first. Of, uh, when, when you look at a reasonableness statute and, and changing where we are now to something along those lines, if you don't articulate very clearly um, all of the factors that are presented um, in the perspective of the law enforcement officer, what, what is occurring, what the, what the subject is doing, and all of those things. And, it, and if there are not some verbiage in that, in, in that change that, that, that put that in, then you are making by changing from subjective to reasonably objective, you are interjecting a lot of subjectivity in the decision maker's ability to decide what may or may not be reasonable. And, um, you know, there's a concern in law enforcement that with, without those kind of protections in a change in the statute, um, you know, the, 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 the decision-making uh, process for a law enforcement officer in these situations would become elongated. And everyone would need to, to, to get used to the fact that um, rather than showing up and believing that this person was about to uh, inflict serious bodily harm or death upon someone else, I have to go through an additional checklist in my brain um, to make sure that I'm being objectively reasonable because um, if I don't and I take action, I could be held criminally liable. So I think, I think there is room for a, re a reasonableness component in the law, but I think it has to incorporate those things that, that Mr. O'Neill touched on um, and that everyone here recognizes and understands that, you know, the, the, the stress of the moment, the adrenaline and, and everything that goes into these uh, horrific encounters. 
Um, second, I just want to make sure the committee knows, and I, I can't speak for all of law enforcement, but um, the adage is that you can't teach an, an, an old dog new tricks. We were very early on in the de-escalation training piece with the state police, and we sent several of our members out to receive training, and uh, they came back as expert certified trainers, and we did some classroom work with all of our members, and then we did some updated training, and we've done it multiple times where we actually do scenario-based training um, with the people in mental distress and trying to use uh, verbal triggers that you've been taught in your training and other things to de-escalate that person and seeing um, in real live time um, how things can get very bad very quickly if you don't do, do it right and how things can go very well if you do do it right. And um, that's training that it involves um, use of deadly force if it, if it, if it becomes necessary. And then it, it, it's also reviewed with the individual officers based on what they did, how they either escalated the situation, de-escalated the situation, whether if they had done something different, they, sh they would have been able to use deadly force or whether they got so um, engaged that they, they lost their tactical advantage and put themselves in harm's way. So, so there is training that, that is ongoing. Um, I would agree um, with everyone that said, um, that's something that needs to be provided statewide to all 48 agencies as best we can and, and do scenario-based training in addition to classroom training and have experts speak to it. Because I think once you, you actually um, engage in that and participate in that, you really do gain a whole different perspective on what law enforcement officers um, are dealing with when they come in, in, in contact with some of these folks that are in mental distress. I agree. Lieutenant Breck and I, I absolutely agree. It, it is a strange sort of twist of fate. We were working with the, uh, not that we agree, that <laughs> I didn't mean that, sorry. <laughs> but uh, we were working with the police chief's council to get that kind of training that the Delaware State Police have had uh, to Delaware. It, it's free. The Police Executive Research Forum does it. Chuck Wexler and company, they do it. They will come out. They will train the trainers, get certified, and then we could have every police officer in every department trained. So, you know, COVID hit. It, it, it made it exponentially more difficult, but it has to happen. I agree with you completely. And, and the state police approach to that kind of training is so important because doing it in the academy, I think AJ may have said this, you do it once and then 10 years later, you know, you may be in a situation and you're not gonna have it in your mind. So I think it has to be, I agree with you, it has to be a, an ongoing training and that we need the resources to make sure that everybody gets that training. So they will do it. The Police Executive Research Forum will come out and do it. The issue, I think, in some of the smaller departments that we were running into is they literally can't spare an officer for the number of hours in a day that it's going to take. So it's going to take a coordination with large, mid-sized departments to, to make that happen, because I agree it does need to happen. And, and so in terms of the use of force statute, let's have that discussion, a deeper discussion about adding under all of the facts and circumstances, the officer, as the officer believed them to be, et cetera, or other language and look at some other states that have done that so that we are making sure that if we make a change, that it would include all the circumstances that many of you have just discussed. Kathy, along with that, I think, you know, um, in conjunction with that, uh, looking at whether we really need to change uh, 465, uh, 464, 65, and 66, in addition to changing 467, which specifically addresses law enforcement. I, I, I think you can probably anticipate what my position is going to be, is that, that we don't, on the defense side, think it appropriate to change the substantive law as it applies to, or recommend change, um, to the General Assembly. Our task force is for law enforcement accountability. It is not to work a substantive revision of Delaware substantive criminal law. 
No, I understand, Brendan, and I fully okay. anticipated that, yeah, yeah. that being an issue. And that's why it's a bill that needs to be discussed. Okay. And so, I, also, I... I also think that it's important uh, for the people on the subcommittee to understand as well, when we're talking about a use of force statute, what's permissible, what's not permissible, that in Delaware, the state has the burden of disproving self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. And so it is, you know, it's, it's hard to look at another state's law in a vacuum. So throughout the trial, the state has the burden of disproving the use of force justification in a statute beyond a reasonable doubt. So it, you know, it's- it maybe right legally, it doesn't seem that way to us, I could tell you that much. Well, I don't know, it seems that way to us because it factors into the charging decision as well. But, you know, I, I think we have a lot we can talk about in a lot of areas where we can all agree. Um, and go ahead. Uh, can we assume that'll be uh, on an agenda for yes. a future subcommittee meeting? You can, yes. Great, Certainly. okay. And so I think it's time because the next slide is up for discussion and questions for public comment. Does that, um, unless someone else has a comment or thought that we haven't discussed yet. All right. I, I, if I could, um, if I could. Of course. <laughs> Just piggybacking on everything that has been said, I, I do appreciate the materials that were submitted by DOJ and, and one material in particular the fact that there are four states that have recently passed use of force reforms, I think it's a really important thing to look at because there are four really good laws that go into specifics of what de-escalation should look like. Uh, Minnesota goes into the specifics of what good training and good policy across the state of Minnesota should look like. And also um, piggybacking on the statute itself of 464 to 467, that there are a couple of states, Minnesota and Oregon, that have added language that only applies uh, to law enforcement. Minnesota asks, what would an objectively reasonable officer believe? Um, and that appears to only apply to law enforcement. So I think there is a precedent for that to happen, for reasonableness to only be added um, just for law enforcement. But I, I know that's a discussion for another day. But I do think that that, um, that memo and those four state laws should be looked at closely for a model for some things that we can look at. Yeah, that's a really good idea, James. So we we ought to highlight those four state laws, the, the laws that were recently enacted. So it was Minnesota, Colorado, right? That's correct, Connecticut and, and Oregon. Connecticut and Oregon, yes. So we'll make sure that we've highlighted those and explain them in more detail for the next meeting. I think that would be helpful, thank you. Any other thoughts? Okay, hearing none, um, we can turn this over to Sarah, I believe, for public comment. Any person who wishes to give public comment should utilize the raise hand at this time. Michael Lawson, you are now permitted to speak. You have two minutes. Hi, thank you, Sarah. Uh, this is Mike Lawson with the Fraternal Report of Police in Delaware. Just wanted to thank the committee for getting together. Uh, AG uh, Jennings, thank you very much for um, chairing and also uh, Mr. Bond. Um, just one comment is um, we have several experts on the committee and what I would recommend is that you reach out and bring on any experts as far as in law enforcement who have been involved in deadly force shootings. Um, when you talk about reasonableness um, and also state of mind, you wanna make sure that you're speaking with the officers who've been involved um, in these incidents so that you can actually have um, their thoughts uh, before making any kind of judgment as far as what the officer actually did. Uh, they are scrutinized, they are investigated by several uh, different entities when they are involved in the incident. And I just wanna make sure that law enforcement is involved as far as those who've been involved and deadly force shootings. Thank you. Thank you. It's an excellent suggestion.
Keith Stack, you have been permitted to speak. You now have two minutes. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, um, I am a member of, um, as Delcog's representative on the Subcommittee on Transparency and Accountability. So I just wanted to let you know that my comments are actually from a um, um, personal perspective and not necessarily that of um, Delcog's. But one thing, um, well, two comments. One is I think it would be really helpful for the public and maybe even your own internal discussions to um, describe what use of force is because there are obviously different types of use of force. Are you talking about um, these individual settings or are you talking about use of force in, um, in situations where there are groups of people involved, whether they're um, protests um, or something similar? Um, a second issue is uh, body cameras. It, it just seems to me that that's a very useful tool. It's um, not, not really discussed very much here, um, but I don't think the public understands to what extent body cameras are being used um, and the benefits of those. I know there's an issue of resource that gets into another um, a broader point, um, two points on that. And that is um, what kind of public commitment is there willing to be regarding resources, whether it's funding, um, time, et cetera. And then the second part of that is the time frame for some of these actions. I know we're all under, I know all the subcommittees are under a tight time frames to try and get something done. But the reality is some of this is going to happen. Some of these actions and things can happen relatively quickly. Um, depending on the, on the subcommittee, et cetera. Um, other things are not going to happen quickly and the public needs to be aware of that, um, that um, of, the, of those variations in, in actions in time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. And we did not discuss it today, but I think it's really important um, in response to your very good questions that, that we briefly sort of outline uh, what's happening with respect to the implementation of a statewide body-worn camera program for every police officer in the state. It largely is a resource issue. Just about every police chief in the state wants a body-worn camera program. The public overwhelmingly wants a body-worn camera program for police everywhere. And I think it's safe to say that, you know, the attorney general's office and most other criminal justice agencies are fully on board with it as well. So we have asked a number of state agencies and including the Delaware State Police and others to give us an estimate of a budgetary ask, you know, what is it gonna to take to put a body worn camera um, in every department on every police officer. And I think we have the numbers or we're still gathering the specifics of those numbers. We've been working with a congressional delegation, in particular, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester um, to discuss, you know, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna get the money? Uh, because it is critically important that this happens. As, as Chief Kraisola said during our meeting, He's now seen them in Middletown and, and says they're great. And every police chief I've ever talked to who has a body-worn camera program says the same thing. So I think this is largely a matter of resources and we are working really hard to make this happen. Uh, your advocacy would be very helpful and the advocacy of people on this subcommittee will be really important to, to make sure we have the resources so for it to be successful. The second piece is a body-worn camera model policy. We've been looking at the model policy Police Chiefs Council adopted years ago that we worked on. And we think there probably are some updates that ought to occur um, because policies sometimes need tweaking over the years. This one certainly may. Um, so we'll be working on that as well. And, and it's my fault, I neglected to really cover body-worn cameras in this discussion because it's 
related, but not quite as directly related as the actual changes to statute and policy, education and training. Um, but it's a really important component of it. Thank you. Cynthia Smith, you are now permitted to speak. You have two minutes. Hello. Hello. Can, can somebody hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Thank okay, you. Great. My name is Cynthia Smith. I, um, um, I just wanted to um, uh, mention something about the, um, you know, taking the de-escalation um, training and, you know, we, along with the crisis intervention, intervention training. Uh, I think that if we are going to uh, measure the um, the outcome of this subcommittee. I think that there needs to have uh, some kind of a measurement, which which includes number of incidents, severity of an incident, number of injuries, application of de-escalation, use of force, and finally, organizational impact. I I'm more than happy to actually. Um, use uh, follow this up with a you know with a um, testimony or send it out prior to the meeting for next month. Uh, next next meeting, I wanted to also talk about if we are going to engage our community, uh, giving you know giving being trusting our law enforcement. I think that. There needs to have a chain of communication where we can actually discuss this openly and friendly in a friendly manner without, you know, having some biases or you know, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Also, if there's some kind of incident happens, there needs to have some recusal, and I think that um, also would there be a problem since. Uh, we still don't have, you know, if if, if the attorney general um, is uh, representing the the state, who represent us, the people, because I think there's a conflict of interest, and I think that maybe should we even consider having inspector general, um, it, you know, after this, I mean, in in a recommendation because we need to have. Uh, our representation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And we will take you up on testimony and on presenting materials to us. We'd very much like to see those. And where can we, where can I send it to? Email addresses should be up there for you to see right now. Okay. Can you see Thank that? You. Sure. Yes. And this goes to all the uh, subcommittee members, correct? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Attorney General? Yes. Uh, this is Larry Johnson. I'm sorry for the lack of video. Um, with regards to Ms. Smith, if you could convey to her that uh, I am on this committee as a private citizen and she's more than welcome to contact me if she wishes to. Thank you. Ms. Smith, did you hear that? She she can't unmute herself. I don't think so. Okay. Can, can, can I get a contact number, please? Um, if, if you can include that your your number in the uh, in your comments, I'll be glad to give you a call. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Miss Smith. If anyone else wishes to give public comment, please utilize the raise hand function at this time. Chase Roy, you are now permitted to speak. You have two minutes. Hi, right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect, good. Um, just full disclosure, I am a, a member of uh, DTI. I'm, I'm working with the, the streaming and, and everything here as well. But I wanted to take a moment to speak as a public citizen. 
Um, I'd like to thank the committee for getting everyone together and, and tackling what obviously is a really difficult issue here. Um, but I'd like to echo Cynthia's comments here uh, on myself. The, the members of the task force right now are pretty much all members of the justice part the process. You got police, you got police chiefs, you've got police union members, you've got journalists, attorneys, the attorney general. It seems like there's very few members of the public or anybody of public interest that would would um, benefit for an opposing point of view on this this task force, and that definitely concerns me a lot. Um, also, earlier. Uh, I can't remember who was speaking, uh, but somebody was speaking of when the use of deadly force is applied, uh, you know, you, you got to see what other options were available to the to the officer, but you also have to take into consideration the victim's state of mind, the victim's past history, the victim's aggressiveness, and all this stuff about the victim, but there was very little talk about any of that on the officer's side as well. The officer might be having a bad day. The officer might have been more aggressive than he needed to be. All of those things need to be considered as well, and, and, and it, may be, it may have been implied but it wasn't spoken and and that's what also concerns me is it's it's very much looking at the public and saying uh what did they do wrong and not turning the camera around and saying what did the police do wrong in that situation and that definitely needs to be addressed as well um because the the, the amount of anxiety during police stops for people or during any kind of interaction with police can get really really high really fast panic can ensue police are armed to the teeth a lot of the times they have their hands on their weapons while they're speaking and citizens are not and that is a nerve-wracking experience for a lot of people and you're asking them to have more restraint than the police officer themselves that are stopping them and it, it needs to be turned around it needs to be looked at from a different scope it needs to be looked at from an opposing point of view instead of just one point of view on what can we do uh just in terms of of this one specific subject um, and okay. that's that's all i have to say thank you thank you mr roy would you like to participate along with our subcommittee on a regular basis because your input is really invaluable. And I think everything you've said is, is consistent with what we ought to be discussing. Yes, I, I, if that opportunity arose, I would like that. Um, Sarah knows how to get a hold of me as well and we can talk about that offline. Thank you, thank you very much. Attorney General, this is Larry again. I'd just like to interject um, and offer my services uh, again as a private citizen. I understand that a lot of members of the public may be uncomfortable speaking to people in positions of authority or positions of uh, public um, of, of a public nature. But uh, as I, I mentioned before, I am a private citizen. I am also a uh, a mediator um, in my professional life. Um, and I would more than welcome any private citizen who may feel uncomfortable speaking to law enforcement or people in, in government um, if they'd like to communicate with me uh, specifically in order to be able to go so that they won't have uh, that anxiety of uh, possibly being um, well, again, uncomfortable speaking with people in positions of authority, I'm more than welcome to entertain their their comments and questions and uh, try to collate some information for the committee if compete if, if the public feels uh, uh, that uh, I, those services I can render would be of, uh, of use and value. Thank you, Larry. That concludes our public comment. People can still submit their public comments to our email inbox. That's leotaskforce at delaware.gov, leotaskforce at delaware.gov. Okay, I believe that completes our agenda for today. And do we have a date? All right, apparently we have a date in October and I can't find it, but Sarah, do you have that date? It's October 15th. October Thursday. 15th. Yep. Got it. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And um, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much, everyone. This was a very, very helpful and honest discussion. I, I think we all are appreciative of each other's input. Thank you.
Thank you, Vice Chair. And with that, we are concluded.